Amen. It is good to gather together. Amen. And it is good to be here with the fellow three to four hundred people that we have in our sanctuary here today. But for those of you who do not know, this past week there has been another gathering of Adventist young people. And instead of three to four hundred people, it has been around 60,000 people. The uh, International Pathfinder Camporee was happening this past week, and it was a wonderful time for our Pathfinders. We have some Pathfinders who are there or actually are on their way back um, at the moment, and uh, they were gathered together for um, inspiration, for a reminder and a refresher of what we are called to do and who we are called to be together. Um, it was a wonderful time. We're going to share a little bit more about that from some of our Pathfinders next week as they come back. We'll have a report. Um, lots of people, lots of gatherings, but there was also some challenges and storms. Um, there were storms throughout the week. There was a storm today that's happening there, which is why some of our our, children, our Pathfinders are coming back early, and it's, it's wonderful, so I'm asking you to keep our Pathfinders in your prayers as they head back to various parts of the world. We have people from around North America, but also people from around the world were gathered, from Australia, from Brazil, from, I don't know if there was anyone from South Africa, I'm hoping so, um, and again, we'll hear more about it next week. It's wonderful to have this gathering of Adventist young people, because there's a saying that says, the church is always one generation away from extinction. If we don't pass on our faith to the next generation, then what happens, right? We are called to, to come together and not just keep a message for ourselves, but to share it. Come together for encouragement and inspiration, but also to go from here and to share the mission of our church community. If you are here for the first time today, we are in a series that we've been doing this summer called What is Adventism All About? Our summer series. And we've spoken about a lot of different things, a lot of different beliefs and understandings that we as Adventists have that help shape our understanding of who God is and what God asks from us and shapes who we are. We spoke about the questions around why do bad things happen to good people and the great controversy that helps us understand that. We spoke about what happens after we die and hell and health and wholeness and education. Today, we've been doing this review over this summer, but today the sermon is entitled A Special Mission. We as Adventists are part of a larger Christian community, and if you're joining us from a different Christian denomination, there are many beliefs that we share, but we are also a distinct denomination, doing our best to follow Jesus faithfully in a way that sometimes leads us in a different direction. And so we're going to finish our series today and next week with this focus on a special mission of Adventists. Today we're going to take a bit of a big picture view, and the next week we'll go a little bit more in detail with some specific passages in Scripture. I've shared before, and, and as I mentioned, some of this may be review for some of us, and hopefully will help us remember when we're sharing the message. Um, but I shared before that the World Christian Encyclopedia has said that there are 30,000 different Christian denominations in this world in over 230 countries. 30,000 different denominations. This is a lot of different Christian denominations, right? Not all of them are Protestants, many of them are independent, but they all claim to be Christian in some way. And as I've mentioned before, we share a lot with our brothers and sisters who also believe in Christ. We believe in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus as our salvation, but we also have to answer this question, why be denomination number 24,999? What do we have to say for ourselves, not just as Christians, but as Seventh-day Adventist Christians? I am here, and I suspect that many of you are here as well, because we believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church does have something important to share, a message in particular that we want to make sure the rest of our community hears and the world hears. 
And so today we'll be focusing on unpacking two words, one of them hyphenated, that have long pointed to who we are as a community. These two words I've shared with you before, you might have heard this before, because we have said these two words many, many times before as a community. If you are new, this might be for the very first time that you're, you're unpacking this, but I want to do this review together, to unpack these two words. Seventh day, Adventist. We are here gathered as a community of Seventh-day Adventists. Our name was carefully chosen as a denomination. We went through a long period of discussion and a lot of prayer for this, um, more than a hundred and, what would it be now, 160 odd years ago? On October 1, 1860, in Battle Creek, Michigan, a group of individuals looking for the soon return of Jesus chose this name to represent this movement that had emerged since the 1840s. Approximately 3,000 members of this movement were there, were in the movement, and 25 were there representing different groups to try and figure out what name should we call this movement that is happening. Many Adventist churches had chosen different names for their congregations, and and there was a sense that we needed to to articulate what it meant to be part of this movement and this group together. And so it was that 25 delegates met on an autumn day in the Michigan town of Battle Creek in 1860 to discuss adopting a name. And after a couple of days of discussion, Some of them were nervous about adopting a name because they came from different denominations and they wanted to say, let's just have a movement. But others said, we need a name that that helps us understand the essence of who we are. A man by the name of David Hewitt, who was known to be the most honest man in Battle Creek, that was his name, wouldn't that be a great title for yourself, to be known as the most honest person in Paradise Valley? The most honest man in Battle Creek, David Hewitt, suggested the name Seventh-day Adventist. A lengthy discussion followed, but when the vote came, it was voted 24 to 1. Don't ask me what the one person wanted their name to be. I'm not sure. I'll have to do some research, but 24 to 1 said, there's something about these two words, one of them hyphenated, that goes to the core of who we are. I remember one of my professors in seminary who was teaching a class on Seventh-day Adventist theology, and they explored this idea that to say we are Seventh-day Adventist isn't just to note some of the interesting things we believe, but it's to say something important about who God is, what God is about, and how we are called to live in light of that. It is in an important way to proclaim the very gospel itself. And I wanted to remind us of this because... This is a great way, if you are traveling like I do, and and somebody says, oh, what do you do? And you say, well, I I work with the church. Oh, what church? And then you say, Seventh-day Adventist. And they say, what is Seventh-day Adventism about? You've got two words, two words, that I'm hoping you can help share when people ask you this question. And you can give them the short answer, and today we're giving you a little bit of a longer answer. What is Seventh-day Adventism? all about. So we're going to start with this noun of our name, a review for some of us. We are Seventh-day Adventist. What comes to mind when you hear the word Adventist? You can say it. Second coming. For those of you who've grown up Adventist, this might be the very first picture that comes to your mind when you hear the word Adventist. The second coming. To be Adventist is to live in hope of the second coming. And if this is your first time, if you don't really know what Adventism is all about, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to the end of Scripture, to the book of Revelation, chapter 21. We have a beautiful picture of the second coming of Jesus Christ that is spoken about 
in Scripture, in Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21, 1 through 5 reads this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. Amen. If this is your first time reading these words in Revelation, underline them, circle them, highlight them, I turn to this passage over and over again in my life. Because part of what it means to be Adventist is to be a community that lives in anticipation of that vision, of that holy city coming out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. What comes to your heart and mind when you hear these words? Do you find it comforting or inspiring? I hope it captures your heart and imagination. I hope it gives you comfort in difficult times. It paints a picture of what we get to look forward to. It's a beautiful picture of a time with no tears, but most importantly, I love this verse. God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. The true gift of heaven is not the lack of pain, although the lack of pain is wonderful. And it's not the end of tears, although the end of tears is wonderful. The true gift of heaven is that there will be no longer any separation between God and God's people. Amen? If you have felt that separation or longed to draw closer to God, this is what it means to be Adventist. Part of the Adventist big picture is to know that God himself will be with us and be our God, that God is coming back. Part of the Adventist big picture is also understanding some of these things that we have been going through so far in terms of our what is Adventism all about. We understand that there's a great controversy over the character of God. Is God good? What are God's plans for us? What are God's plans for those who reject him? What are God's plans for the redeemed? Can God be trusted? Is God really love? And here we see at the end of scripture, we see God's plan reaching its final consummation, its end. Sin and pain and sorrow will be wiped away. God himself would pitch his tent among his people and be their God. So this is one of the pictures that we have in mind when we talk about being Adventist. We are the people who are living in anticipation that Jesus Christ is coming again and Jesus Christ is coming soon. Amen? But, and I want to... This is a refresher for some of us because I I hope you've heard me say this before because I have. I've been saying this for the past five years. When we talk about the Advent, we're talking about the second coming. But what else does Advent mean? What does the word Advent mean? Anybody can tell me. What does the word Advent mean? Something coming, right? So it, it... doesn't just mean the second coming, it means the coming. 
So we have the second coming because we have a what? A first coming. To be Adventist is to believe in the second coming because we also believe in the first coming. That Jesus is coming again because Jesus has come before. I remember a friend of mine talking at one point about faith like a rope. And I've shared this illustration before. Sometimes when you've been waiting for something for so long, your faith can start to to slip a little bit. And he describes faith like a rope with knots in them. And if you're trying to climb up the rope and you find yourself slipping, the knot will catch you. These moments of things that you can trust no matter what. We know that we might be in between times, that we might be, be trying to reach or wait for the next knot, but if we find ourselves slipping, we can catch the knot that Jesus has come before, so Jesus is coming again. Amen? Let's not just think of Advent in terms of the second coming, but we are an Advent people because we believe in a God who comes to us. Jesus has come before. Amen. To be an Advent people is to say, we believe in a God who is coming and who has come. We talk about this quite a bit here at Paradise Valley Church, actually. Because part of the idea about an Advent God, a God who comes to us, is this idea that we don't find our way to God, God finds God's way to us. Amen? And we talk about this when we say we love because he first loved us, right? Who loves who first? God loves us first. To be an Advent people is to be a people who believes that God makes the first move. God makes the first, God makes the move towards us always. God is always making the move towards us. We can't find our way to God, but God has and continues to find God's way to us. Amen? Amen. God is coming again. Jesus is coming again. And we know this because Jesus has come before. But this moment with Jesus coming in a manger is not the first time God came to humanity. God shows up at the very, very beginning in creation, showing up first. It wasn't humans somehow gathering ourselves up together and then going on a quest to find God. God created us. God came to create us. God came and called Abraham. God came in Jesus. God came in the Holy Spirit. God shows up in our lives. And God is coming again. Amen. We remember what God says in the beginning of Revelation. In Revelation 1, verse 8, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is and was and who is to come. He is in the present, he was in the past, and he is to come. And we, as Adventist people, believe this and we proclaim this. So when somebody asks you, what do Adventists believe? We can, if you've got a very short amount of time, say, Adventists believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen? If you've got a little bit longer time, you can say, Adventists believe in a God who always comes to us first. He's coming back to us, and he came to us first. We believe in a God who loves us first. We believe in a God who comes to us first. It is in our name, Adventist. That's the first part. Seventh-day Adventist. Believing in a God who comes and is coming, and will come again. Praise the Lord. <laughs> now the first part. And again, we have talked about this several times before. If this is your first time here, 
We're talking about the Seventh Day Adventist. And this is why we worship on the seventh day. We hold the seventh day as our Sabbath. We're going to do a broad overview here today, a big picture kind of view. But if you're interested in more of this, last year during the summer I did a series on the Sabbath because the seventh day is a big part of our identity and who we believe we are because we believe it is a huge part of Scripture and who God is calling us to be. So the second part of our name is the adjective. We are Seventh-day Adventists. A couple years ago, I taught a class at last year university that was an intro to Seventh-day Adventism class. It was an undergrad class, and we had a lot of students there who were coming from not Adventist backgrounds, and this was their first encounter with Adventism, and some of them had only been here for a couple of months. And so I asked them in the beginning of this class, tell me, what do you know about Adventism? And I wrote up their answers on the board, and they said, well, we know that you Adventists are vegetarian. And so I said, some of us are, and I wrote it on the board. And some say, well, you believe in the Trinity? And I said, yes, that's great, wrote it on the board. Um, one person, I might have shared this with you before, one person said that Adventists build universities on hills. Said, well, I don't know if that's a fundamental belief, but this university is built on a hill, and actually several of our universities are built on hills, but that's not, it's, you don't have to build on hills in order to be saved. But we did get one or two people who said, oh yeah, don't you guys, don't you guys go to church on Saturday? Yeah. What's that all about? I've had other pastors from different denominations actually ask me this recently. There's a, a um, documentary that's just come out from uh, non-Adventist faith-based communities who are wanting to look again at the Sabbath because there's a sense that maybe the larger Christian community has missed something about the Sabbath. And we as Seventh-day Adventists say, yes, there is a gift here that's really important. People notice our practice of the seventh day Sabbath. It's unusual, it is countercultural, it's particular, but it is a core part of what we have to say for ourselves. Why be Christian denomination number 29,999? Well, in part because of the Sabbath. We'll talk a little bit more about this at, uh, next week. We've talked about it um, in past sermon series. But I want to say, if to be Adventist is to say something about God, God is the God who comes to us first, then to be Seventh-day Adventist is the way we put those words into action, is how we let God shape our lives. I mentioned that today... It is the time to look at a, the big picture. And this is a review of the sermon series that we did last summer. But the big picture of the Sabbath is that it is talked about repeatedly in Scripture. There's over 300 verses that are referenced in Scripture that link the Sabbath to many core themes like creation and covenant and sanctuary and liberation and jubilee and a day for healing and restoration and if you're wanting a Bible verse on the importance of the Sabbath, I can give you a whole ton of them. Today, we're going to focus on the big picture of Sabbath, starting from the beginning. The Sabbath is presented from the very beginning. In the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth, and as a finishing touch, as the culmination of everything, he says, here, here, my beloved created world is the Sabbath. My crowning jewel, my gift to you, the Sabbath. For six days, God formed the spaces and cosmos and sky and seas and land, and he filled them with stars and birds and fish and animals. And on the seventh day, God forms a day and he fills it with God's presence. From the very beginning, the Sabbath is not just a reminder to rest or to enjoy each other, at the heart of the Sabbath is the reminder and the reality and the promise of God's faithfulness and this gift, that God is the God who comes to be with us. What does God do on the seventh day? He sets it aside and he rests 
and he makes it holy, which in scripture, the only thing that could be holy is the thing that's filled with God's presence. That's what holiness means. So if God makes something holy, he fills it with his presence in a special way. God makes the Sabbath holy by filling it with his presence in a special way. What would it mean if once a week we truly grasped the idea that God created us in order to be with us? This beautiful creation story. When we say we are Seventh-day Adventists, if you have a little bit of time, you can tell somebody that means that we go to church on Saturday. And I actually literally just said this to somebody on the plane the other day. They asked me, what denomination are you at? And I said, I'm Seventh-day Adventist. We keep the Jewish Sabbath from Friday to Saturday. And that, I had 30 seconds and that was it. If you have a little bit more time, we keep the Sabbath that God created in creation and made holy. We see it in creation and we think it was really special and important. And then we can continue the story if we have a little bit more time. A little later in the story, God leads a small despised group of people called the Israelites out of Egypt and God frees them from slavery and God forms a covenant with them and says, I will be your God and you will be my people. And at the center of this covenant, God says, I'm going to give you the Sabbath. You've been slaves for 400 years. You don't quite know what it is to live in freedom. So I'm going to give you something that will help you live in freedom. And what is it? The Sabbath. I know that there may be some people here who don't necessarily connect freedom with the Sabbath. But it is connected. Read the two versions of the Ten Commandments. One version says, keep the seventh day holy because of creation. The second version says, keep the seventh day holy because on that day I liberated you. I set you free. The Sabbath is connected with freedom. The freedom to truly grasp the idea that our worth is not connected to what we get done or how much we produce or what we can do ourselves but that our worth is connected in truly resting in the God who sets us free. Amen? Later still in the story, a baby is born, Jesus. And this baby grows up and does such amazing things and says such incredible things that people start to follow him. And most startling of all, this baby claims when he's grown up, that if you see him, you have seen the Father. The baby is God with us, Jesus the Messiah, and he's killed for this claim. And interestingly enough, we have in this story of Jesus' crucifixion a Sabbath. I don't know if you've noticed it before. We've tried to mention it here at this church, but Jesus is crucified on Friday. Jesus is resurrected on Sunday. And so what does Jesus do between his crucifixion and his resurrection? Jesus rests on the Sabbath for a full Sabbath. Jesus is dead. For a full Sabbath, God with us has gone to the very bitter end of human experience. What it, would it mean if every Sabbath we remembered that the God of the universe has experienced the depths of human suffering? When even if we are faced with death, we can hear God's voice saying, I have been here too. The Sabbath reminds us of a God who created us, a God who set us free, a God who is willing to go even to the grave for us over the Sabbath. But this is not the final Sabbath in the story. In the book of Isaiah, chapters 58 and 61, the prophet describes a scene of abundance and plenty, a time of jubilee, which is known as the Sabbath of Sabbaths. And this jubilee is the time when the refugees are able to come home, when evil will be overthrown. It is a scene of great joy and abundance. In the book of Revelation... The author John takes the scenes from Isaiah and he expands them and extends those scenes. And we know the scene well because it's the passage that we started with today. Revelation 21 expands this image of the Sabbath of Sabbaths, which is the day that all Sabbaths are pointing towards. That day. Look, 
God's dwelling place is now among his people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. What if God requires that we keep the Sabbath, and he puts it in the Ten Commandments, not just for God's sake, but also for our sake? We as humans have such an easy time focusing on the small stuff and forgetting the big picture. The Sabbath helps us remember the God who created us and died for us and is coming soon to take us home. I've done this activity with us a couple times before, which is the activity of of looking at something that is zoomed in really close and trying to figure out what it is. And so we're going to see if any of you can figure out some of these next pictures. This is a picture of something zoomed very close in. What is this? Anybody think they know? It's a mineral, somebody thinks? Rocks? (laughs) Chicken? McNuggets? I don't... (laughs) I'm not sure what that looks like. It's a cornflake. Cereal. It's a cereal. All right. You guys need to take a good look at your cereal. Here's another one. What is this? We're going to zoom in, and then we're going to look out. We'll see the big picture. We'll zoom in. What do we think it is? It's not Cheerios. It's a snack, somebody said? Not Cheerios, no. We might actually see some of these in our meal right after church today. We don't always see the full picture when we're zoomed too close in. Here's the final one. What do you think this is? Charcoal? Chocolate. Chocolate would be delicious. It's making me slightly hungry, but it's not chocolate. We're zoomed so close in, we can't always see the big picture. It is a book. A book. Sometimes, sometimes we may zoom so close into something that we lose sight of the big picture. We are Seventh day Adventists, and that doesn't just mean we are a people who keep certain rules or certain requirements or has a list of do's and don'ts. We are Seventh day Adventists because it shapes. Because it it shows us a picture of who God is and what God has called us to. We are Seventh-day Adventists because we believe in the God who comes to us first. And we believe in the God who has given us a gift of the Sabbath, which reminds us of the God who created us and the God who set us free and the God who is coming once again to restore us. We have Sabbath where we celebrate our creation, where we practice liberation, where we embody salvation. The Sabbath has an important role to play in our past history as the people of God. And Adventists believe that observing the Sabbath has an important role to play in our near future as well. Next week, we're going to wrap up our series with a closer look at just what this special role as Adventists in this time of history is. We're going to zoom in a little bit, but I wanted to make sure we zoomed in after we had the big picture so that when we zoom in on the pages of the book, we know what they are versus the other way around. So next week, we'll zoom in a little bit more. But today in our series of What is Adventism All About?, we unpacked this name, Seventh-day Adventist. I know that sometimes it can be hard to remember everything that is shared in a sermon. Sometimes I forget everything that I've shared in my sermons. But hopefully we can remember these two words, Seventh-day Adventist, because we repeat it often enough. And hopefully we have not just the 30-second response if somebody says, 
what does it mean to be Seventh-day Adventist, but we have maybe the two-minute or the five-minute or the ten-minute response as well. What it means to be Seventh-day Adventist is it means to be part of a community of people who believe in a God who comes to us first, a God who loved us first, and because we know that this God has always been coming to us, we know that he is coming again. Amen? Amen. To be Seventh-day Adventist is to believe and proclaim that the Jesus who has come is coming again. And to be Seventh-day Adventist is to celebrate and proclaim that the Seventh-day Sabbath is a gift from God that reminds us of who God is, this God who created us and liberated us and saved us. Earlier today, we sang together the song, We Have This Hope. And so I want to close with these words of this song. We have this hope that burns within our hearts, hope in the coming of the Lord. We have this faith that Christ alone imparts, faith in the promise of his word. We believe the time is here when the nations far and near shall awake and shout and sing, hallelujah, Christ is King. We have this hope that burns within our hearts, hope in the coming of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for this hope. We thank you for these words, Seventh-day Adventist, that remind us of your faithfulness, of your goodness of the fact that we can trust this vision that we've seen in Revelation 21 because you have said that these words are trustworthy and true. God, as we wait and work towards your soon return, give us hope, give us courage, help us follow in your footsteps. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. We invite you as we go from here to join us for our potluck next door and happy Sabbath.